Hi, I'm Rajiv, and today I have someone very special with me, Mike Ward, and he's here to share his technique of penmanship with all of you out there. There's this calligraphers, the penmanship association, it's called Iampeth. It's the International Association of Master Penmen, Engrossers, and Teachers of Handwriting. I have a mouthful. <laughs> I will put the link to Iampeth in the description of this video. But but what it is, it's it's a national organization. International. It's international? Yep. It's an international association for people that are interested in calligraphy and penmanship. And there was a point after I started my own calligraphy business where I thought, you know, I really would like to learn more. I was self-taught up until that point, and then I got to a place where I started seeing work by well-trained, educated calligraphers, and I thought, geez, I want to learn some stuff. So I found Iampeth. Iampeth meets once a year in a different city every year, usually in the summertime. And it's a week, is it a week? Week long, yep. It's a week long convention where a couple hundred people come together mm -hmm. and classes are offered in the hotel where everyone stays all day, like from nine to five. And it is a wonderful resource for anyone very young or, or much, much Any not so anyway. young <laughs> to, to join <laughs> to join this organization and to start to learn calligraphy or to brush up on some skills to maybe learn a new style. Uh, so that's where we met. Yeah. And I had discovered, I mean, I, have, I was a beginner beginner when I just wanted to improve my handwriting. I discovered Iampeth's website. Mm -hmm. And I just, I would, you say you're self-taught. I was self-taught on the Iampeth website for a number of years before I even knew it was an association that I could join. Mm -hmm. And then when somebody told me that, I had my blinders on practicing, and somebody told me that there was a convention and all this. That's really when my world of calligraphy and penmanship just sort of exploded and grew because then there was a sense of community. So I was growing with people and made friends. I wouldn't have met friends like you if I if I wasn't there. So same. I felt like I I felt like I knew what I was doing in my own little world, and yeah. then when I went to Iampeth, I realized how much broader the penmanship world was. And the yeah. thing that I will say is everyone was so welcoming. Like I was intimidated <laughs> by people that really, like we had um, Rick Muffler. Yeah, we who, got the, who, the White uh, House calligrapher. He was the there. calligrapher at the White House. Like mm -hmm. he ran the calligraphy department of the White House and he taught classes at, at Iampeth. Mm -hmm. You just hang out. It's teachers, students, beginners, advanced. Everybody just kind of hangs out and geeks out over calligraphy and writing. And when, when we say geek out, what that means is pe everybody just sits at a table with their pens and their mm -hmm. papers and their notebooks and they share information with each other. Hey, how do you do this? Can you show me how to do this? And it's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful community of sharing. I have Mike here today because when I saw his work, I was just like, oh my gosh. Pressure zone. The pressure's really on. <laughs> he he's also a dancer, yes. and and he is very 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 versed in the movements of the arm and the hand, and that's what I want to share with you today. I feel like I'm not an authority to be teaching this because I've never really taught this, uh, but Mike, who happened to be in New York, is a wonderful teacher, and he's just. He's a perfectionist, and his skill blows my mind. Well, 
What I would love to start with today, Mike, is really starting with the materials that you would use if you were setting up to write a letter. Yeah. Because I think for those of you out there that don't know anything about uh, penmanship or calligraphy, that's kind of the, the tools that were used 100 years ago. Yeah. Uh, it, this is a fascinating process, is just setting up Mm -hmm. to begin writing. So I'm going to clear this stuff and then maybe you could just walk us through how you would set up. Sure, well, first I just want to say the the base tools, what you need, yep. is very minimal. Okay. Um, specifically if you're doing Spencerian or ornamental penmanship, uh, you're going to need an ink. Yes. Uh, so for me, I like to use, I have here a jar of walnut ink. Um, I also have, this is an iron gall ink. Yes. Um, it gives me a, a nicer line, but it's a little harder on my tools and whatnot, so these I don't two, use it as much. These two inks, so walnut ink mm -hmm. and iron gall ink, are both actually from plants, right? Yes. The walnut is actually the shell mm -hmm. of the walnut that's dried, and when we get it, it actually looks like yes. this. They're cr walnut crystals. I mean, how magical does that sound? <laughs> You only need like a what, an eighth of a teaspoon or something, maybe. Like a bump. Um, yeah, just <laughs> these. These are the walnut crystals, and and even this amount. If you want it to be darker brown or a deeper brown, mm -hmm. you add more. Yeah. And then if you want more, you add more. If you want it to be less, pour some out, add a little bit of water. So you can kind of choose uh, the shade of well, sepia, we'll say that you want. I think these are so beautiful. And this is just the dehydrated walnut. To my knowledge. Yeah. It's the, I think it's the extract from the walnut husks yeah. that gets dried and then it, it comes in this form and a tiny bit of this with water will, mm -hmm. will give you a, a whole jar of walnut ink. I will have it my entire life. I'm never going to go through that much yeah. walnut ink because it's... Very economical. So it's very yes. inexpensive. It's, it's what Mike uses, and because of Mike, it's now what I use. <laughs> I also tried iron gall, and iron gall is also the husk of something, right? Well, it's the, the gall of a tree. It iron... does derive from a, a tree-based something, yeah. yes. And, it, and it's corrosive, like it corrodes metal. The acidity will do a number on your, because we use uh, steel nibs, the acidity in there will be rough on your, on your nibs. So the first thing that's part of this process is ink. Yes, and so you gotta have your ink. Yep. This is the liquid walnut ink. Okay. Um, so you have you gotta have your ink. You have to have paper, obviously. Whoa. So here, just some paper here. Um, many any paper that can accept ink works. All different penmen have different favorites, but, and we can talk a little bit more about specifically what this is and compare it to some others. I know you have some of your papers today that we can experiment with, but paper, ink, and a pen is really all you need. However, the pen is, is the tool, and the, I, before you take this out of there, I want to set this up because the pens that, that these calligraphers use, they are like, they're like the Harry Potter wands. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they've become. They're very, they become so personal mm -hmm. that a lot of us have found our pen that we love, usually made out of wood, and they hold nibs. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a nib holder, essentially. Yeah. And this, this becomes something that is our, it's, it's, it's our main sentimental tool that yeah. becomes a part of the process because we hold it for so long. Yeah, well, and ever they they are tweaked for everybody's are sort of set up slightly differently because they're not a not a we're not all built the same. Mm -hmm. So a specific grip for a specific person. As you do it more, you want to tweak it and bend it and get it exactly uh, made for you. So it's yeah, I agree. It's, it's a very personal thing. Now Mike is not only a calligrapher and a dancer, but he's also an incredible artisan, and he makes his own pen holders. So well, pen holder. Well, nib holder? Yeah, so once upon a time, a nib would have been referred to as the, as a pen. Mm -hmm. And then the holder was the holder. Mm -hmm. Now we can't, we call the, the pen the nib. So we have nibs and holders. So a nib right. holder, uh, for specifically what I do, Spencerian, we use what is called an oblique holder. So I'll just put out the, the tip of this so you can see it. Normally, the nib would come right out of the end mm -hmm. uh, of a regular, if you imagine just a regular pen. 
But because Spencerian ornamental penmanship and grosser script, all these styles are angled, mm -hmm. and we use the flexibility, you can see the, the flexibility of the nib mm -hmm. to get these wider strokes, in order for the nib to open in the angle of our writing, you want it to be sort of angled a little bit. So rather than not having to bend your hand in, we have this little piece of metal, which is we call a flange, that gives us this angled, uh, angled nib, so this is referred to as an oblique holder. Yep. An oblique holder <laughs> is what I also use, and when I'm out, like when I'm sitting in a coffee shop writing a letter, I'm often asked by people, what, is, what are you writing with? What is that? Because most people have not seen an oblique holder. So Mike, take your holder out of the case and show them. <laughs> Mike, Mike made this. So I didn't want to distract from the oblique part by pulling the whole thing out. So, uh, Pen maker, mm -hmm. uh, Yoke Pen Company actually made, he turns the pens for me. Okay. And then I have, I ask him to leave me a chunk of wood on the end, mm -hmm. to which then I carve things. Little wow. things like so. This is, Look at this. I call this the Kraken holder. It's my little, I don't know if the camera can pick it up, but it's my little octopus. Would you be able to show us some of the other pens that you've made? Because he brought some along and I think. I can't, I you can't. need to see these. It's like visiting all of Anders <laughs> and finding your wand. Like they're all different, they're all handmade, they're all magic. Well, they make I magic. I, I wish I had them in long boxes that I could pull off a shelf and show them to you one by one. So this is just some of the holders I've made, a few of them. <gasps> I call this one, this insane. I call this my Zanarian twist. Zanarian what? was a penmanship college back in the day. I call it the twist because it's completely hollow. It's like a spring. How did you do that? Uh, just with a little knife, you just carve a spiral and just keep going deeper and deeper till there's nothing left. But you can't break any, like, no. the danger of it is that you, you have to be careful. This is a, if you have a tight grip, well, you will break this pen. So it's, wow. you have to be very careful with that one. This is one of the first ones that I made, just a little, a little barrel. It has, the little bands are made from uh, a beer can. Oh, really? Yeah, I was originally going to paint them, and then I figured... Well, I just get some scissors, cut up a, an aluminum can, and give some polish, and they look like they're just glued onto the frame. This one here is one of my favorites. If there's any Harry Potter fans out there, this is the Golden Snitch mm. uh, with gilded snitch and wings into that little guy. All one chunk of wood carved out of one piece. That is so delicate. It took so long to find the proper pattern of what the snitch is supposed to look like. Yes. Because it's only shown from certain angles in the film. So this is the most film accurate snitch. Beautiful. So one more here just yes. of, of the carved ones. For the, it's the inkwell. Oh wow. Little ink with a feather sticking out of it with the words ink carved into the little ink jar. For fun. Amazing. Then one more I have to show, not carved, yes. but it's fun. Okay. Call this the Lego bleak. I was looking at that one. <laughs> it is. Is it Lego? It's Lego. The what? only difference is these two end pieces were glued together. Yeah. And then I sawed the, the entry point and inserted the flange. So this part is solid, but these, they just like Lego, <gasps> you could make them red, green, green yellow. What? You could change the build onto the tail of it. You can make it longer, shorter. It's just Lego. And it feels nice. It's like it's it's it, interesting to write with, just because of the how thin this is down here. Mm -hmm. But it's it was something that I wanted to make for a long time, a fully Lego holder. And it's yeah, it's my Lego bleak. Lego bleak, <laughs> love it. So we have the holder. Yep. We have the ink. We have the paper. Now let's talk about nibs because the nib is kind of, it's a tiny thing that people don't really see, yeah. but it's very important mm -hmm. when it comes to the style of, of writing. Yeah, I mean, there are, especially back in the day, there were countless different variations, flexibility, stiffnesses, fineness, uh, broadness. There were all so many different kinds. Uh, for me, I try to use 
the most flexible and the finest ones available mm-hmm. so I can get the the contrast between my thin lines and my thick lines. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is currently, what is even in here? This is a Leonard Principle nib, okay. which is a modern nib, easily easily acquirable these days. Yes. So the, You probably have some, I, I would d- imagine. I do have some, and that's also because the last time Mike was here, he was giving me little lessons, and we sat together in the coffee shop, and I went out and ordered the Leonard more. I had some, but I ordered more of the Leonard Principle Principle or principality? Principle. The Leonard Principle is based on a mm-hmm. nib from back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, called the Jalop Principality. Okay, and I had a few of those. Yeah. The old, like yeah. the old. They're the ones, ones that they're the sought after ones that we all want. Like the old, <laughs> you can find like old antique boxes of you nibs, can. and and they were sold in a gross. Yep. So they were sold as 144 nibs in a little box mm-hmm. because you go through them. Like the nib actually wears down or yeah, corrodes. It's a disposable item. Yep. And that's when we talk about earlier iron gall ink. It's rough on nibs. If I'm using like a, especially a vintage nib with iron gall ink, I'll get maybe sometimes a day, sometimes a week, sometimes two weeks before that nib is no longer performing uh, nicely and it's garbage. Yep. And then you move on. So I have uh, like a box and all of these nibs will produce different variations of script. Mm -hmm. And today, what Mike is going to use is the Leonard Principal nib. Mm -hmm. And that that is such a key part of this process, is the nib, because it's not only the the size of the nib, but it's actually the the thickness of the metal and Mm -hmm. the flexibility of the metal that enables you to write in a certain way. Yeah. It's like having a pair of jeans. They don't have to be fancy jeans. You just need jeans. If you once you have jeans for a while, you might want some fancy jeans. And that's where my next tool comes in. And that's this, which I always use when I write. I dislike writing without it now. And this is what we call a leather blotter. And it's just a cushion surface th- to write on. A blotter. So blotter, yeah. It can be a confusing term because blotter paper was what they used to soak up excess ink. Yes. This is essentially a leather writing surface. But we call it a blotter for, I don't know where that came into play, mm-hmm. but yeah, leather blotter, just a cushioned writing surface. Now, I don't have one, and I, I've never well, used one. Well, you've never before. had one, but you do today. This is a blotter for Rajiv. What? This is yours you... to use for our little session here today and for all of your sessions Thank after. Thank you, Mike. Did you because, make this? Yes, I made this. I make leather blotters. Make everything. I see you write your letters on this surface, and that is not okay. Why? It's, it, it, it's not not okay, but I usually just put like pieces of paper. Which works, underneath. yes. You can I newspaper do nothing as fancy. long as I do as long as you have the cushion. Yep. Uh, that's okay. But now you can have a proper uh, piece of leather. <gasps> it has my name on it. So I can feel that there is a cushion to this. Yeah. Why is that important to so writing? The when your paper's on the on the surface. You want to have some, it feels better to have some give. Okay. Like there are certain certain styles of calligraphy where this is not necessary and you want to have like a nice hard surface underneath. Mm-hmm. But when we're using, as we mentioned earlier, we use flexibility. We use that, those nibs separate. When we're using, pushing into the paper, when you're releasing, it's nice for the paper's kind of releases with you. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I'm on a hard surface and I push, it's all... I'm just releasing away. I'm just pulling away. Whereas with this, I'm pulling away as it's sort of softening that that release, if yep. that makes sense. So you can totally do uh, the thick and thin strokes on a hard surface, but it's going to be a little friendlier, mm-hmm. for lack of a better word, um, releasing on something cushioned. Okay. I have to show you my pen yes. because my pen, Mike made for me as well. <laughs> when I saw his, I, I asked him if he would make one for me and it's he covers the holder in leather i forgot yours was leather wrapped and it and it broke it, it broke was, it was long it and was. it broke and i just sort of sanded it down but i do have another one i have a backup that is unbroken <laughs> and i just i love that so look at the stitching on the side he stitched that the stitching on these it's specifically so if you hold the pen this way the stitching dodges the thumb and goes into so it angled so that it doesn't interact with your hand. It's so beautiful. It's fun to see it used in worn and good. It makes me happy. 
So this is the same nib that Mike has, mm -hmm. and then this goes into the oblique flange mm -hmm. on the pen holder. And now what we do to prepare the nib is something that I always, if I'm in a coffee shop, I do it very discreetly because if anybody's watching, I think they're some gonna people, wonder what's gonna hap what's happen. Some people are very grossed out by it. So this is what we do. We take our rag or paper towel and just a little bit of saliva. Spit. So long as you haven't been eating any greasy food, it or works. Or coffee. Well, I always Does that not work? Well, no, it, it doesn't. It changes the pH ah, or whatever. So I don't I, drink coffee, so that's... <laughs> I'm usually doing this in a coffee shop, and I always remember that to do this sense. before... With a clean mouth? Yes, before the coffee <laughs> goes in. So the reason why saliva is so special is because of its temperature. It's warm, and it's not hot. Mm -hmm. It's viscosity, mm -hmm. and it's pH. PH. That's, like the, that's the one that, yeah. So it is the perfect thing for any kind of cleaning. And, and even when we clean our nibs, <laughs> nib is look, look so, so, <laughs> so this is, this is why we clean off our nibs. And the saliva thing is, it, it also does something, and I did read about this uh, with relation to using these pens, is it um, makes this hydrophilic. So there's hydrophobic hydro water phobic yeah. afraid of and there's hydrophilic hydro water fill love like philadelphia and there is a noticeable difference when we clean our pens with saliva mm -hmm. and dip it into the ink the ink coats the nib yes which is the most imp i was going to mention like brand new nibs like you've initially when you get a nib yep. it needs to be prepped so like, like a brand new the ones i have in here we should talk new. about this yes. so like in here can you tell them how you, because I know this, but I think this is fascinating. This comes from the factory, and you can't just use it like this, right? No, it would have like some like machine oils or just, it needs to be what we call prepped. Mm -hmm. And there are different methods of prepping. Uh, some people will flash it with a flame really quickly. Like a lighter? Yeah, yep. uh, like Michael Saul uses matches, mm -hmm. a lighter, any flame really to my, to my understanding. I don't do that just because... I don't want to potentially change the temper. Yeah. I don't think it would because you're not doing it long enough anyways, but flame is there. You can flash with a flame. There are some people who keep a potato on their desk. I don't. I also don't use the potato method, but many people swear by it. They keep a, a raw potato mm -hmm. and they basically dip it into a potato. Like you stab the yeah. nib into the potato? Yeah. Or and the, I guess the acids of the potato eat away or clean off any residue or any, they, they prep the nib. Mm -hmm. uh, my go-to and the one that I like because it's foolproof for me is toothpaste. Is yeah, what yeah, I use when I initially... That's what I do. Yeah. Um, just a little bit of toothpaste on a Q-tip, give it a rub, just a scrub, clean it off, and you're good to go. And so you do the toothpaste, then you rinse it off really well. Yeah. And then, and then the coating, whatever oil or protective anti-rust or whatever that's yeah. on the nib, is taken off by the toothpaste, yeah. and now it's ready to actually use, which yeah. is really important because I have had emails from people saying, hey, I got the nib that you recommended, and I got the holder, and I'm trying to write, and the ink is not. It's the most common beginner issue, for sure. Tiny things. Yeah. So this sits on my desk. It doesn't often travel with me when I thank travel. You, thank you, he came the, all the way from Vancouver. This and he sits at this home. Um, I am a Charlie Chaplin and a bowler hat enthusiast. Uh, and all of my inks are in this shape jar. No matter what jar it came in when I purchased it or bottle, mm -hmm. I put everything in this. I have many, many of these jars. Mm -hmm. And so I have this custom-built little wooden bowler hat. Custom-built as in you made I it. I carved this out of one, one chunk of walnut. Um, it has a magnetic closure, so it holds closed. And when it opens, it... The ink goes right in there. You can see I spilled some white ink in there. One point, I gotta clean that out. But it's the perfect size to hold my ink jar, and it just sits in there Look at like that. so. Look at how beautiful this is. <laughs> Let's set up. All right. So I'm gonna get a sheet of paper. Actually, I'm gonna get the journal that you gave me because I love ah. when I'm with you actually using it. There's some of Mike's work that was transferred into a. Mm-hmm. On my choice, that is the same paper that I have loose leaf here is what is it, bound in there. It's bound in here. For Spencerian and ornamental penmanship, it is a smooth, flowing style. Yep. If you sit down to write, 
And if you have tension in your shoulders or you're tense, the writing's gonna look tense. Yeah. Maybe not everybody will see it, but I'll see it. Yeah. Spencerian was designed to be written at length, like all day long to write without tension, without, or staying at ease. Mm -hmm. So because it's designed to be written at ease, we wanna make sure that we're, we use our warm ups to set ourselves up in a place and in a position where, cool, I could write like this for eight hours with no fatigue or no, no anything because there's no tension. People often ask me, doesn't your hand get tired? And it doesn't because of this. Yeah. And in the very in the opening of, of this book, there's a whole section on, on the position in which you should be sitting mm -hmm. and your arm and your feet planted firmly on the ground. I often find myself crossing my feet and then I have to remind myself, <laughs> ah, 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 <laughs> yeah. plant your feet on the ground mm -hmm. because you you do use your whole body. When, yeah. you're, when you're doing this and you're using your whole body in a healthy way mm -hmm. in order to be able to make this sustainable. So let's let's, so let's start warm with up. these warm-ups. Is this okay that I... You should use... A flat piece, just right? Be, yeah, because yeah. you want... If, like if you were using this, if I wasn't here, you'd have it all the way open yes. so it would sit flat, but you should use a... Uh, just a loose leaf so you're not okay. sitting floated. Now, when you write, do you line your paper or do you use like a guide sheet or anything? When I... When I'm actually writing a letter mm -hmm. i always write on lines okay even on an envelope i put lines down and i write okay. on the lines and i leave them there but when i'm okay. doing warm-ups i just do them on do you want a guide sheet with lines on it do you have one i normally write with if i'm writing on white or ivory paper mm -hmm. i use a sheet underneath okay yeah yes if you have one. um i'll give you options here do you, would you like one with the ideal slant angle you can yes, see how please. much ink has bled through this sheet <gasps> i've printed this out i don't know how many probably years ago but it's just a plain sheet of paper. That'll give you just your line spacing. I'll use this one here then. Okay. Oh, what a luxury. Yeah, so then now you can sort of see your lines. And actually, if you want a clip, just so it doesn't go anywhere. Thank you. All right. Now. Step one, we open the ink. <laughs> okay. Pro tip, I think I've, I've meant, this is one I think I gave you when we were at coffee uh, last time I was here. It feels like, like a silly suggestion, but every time you open your ink jar, there's gonna be ink on the top here, mm -hmm. there's gonna be ink in the jar, that will dry and become crumbly, and then the next time you open your ink, what happened with the walnut earlier will happen. So the pro tip, and it takes a while to get in the habit, every time you open an ink jar, you just, Clean out the lid, give it a, one of these on the top, and then that, is, that will never ever be an issue. I don't do that. Most people don't do I that. Because I forgot. But it's, it's the best habit I feel like somebody could get into. Because yes. now it's something I don't think about. If you open a drawer, it's a wipe and a wipe. Yeah. And it's completely just habit now for me to do it. When we're sitting at mm -hmm. the table, this is another this is another very important part of this process. Where our arm, where our arm is sitting on the table. Mm -hmm. It's not off over here. Yeah. It's not it's we're not writing like this. Mm -hmm. It's so important. I'm going to let you explain this cuz this is crucial to this style of writing. Yeah, so we use we use this as the the fleshy bit of our of our forearm is what sits on the edge of the table. So some people will be up a little farther where the elbow is technically over the edge. So I personally write where my elbow is kind of hovering off, um, but that's whatever's comfortable. The important part is that that fleshy bit of the forearm is on the desk and that's what we use. Like I'm not actually moving up and down. I'm using my back and upper arm muscles to move my arm to stretch that flexy bit around. So you can see what that creates is this shape. Like I have about a two inches or so here that we would consider we would call the writing zone. Mm -hmm. Like that's where it's comfortable for me to be in. So I, if I'm writing and I get over here, you can see then I start stretching. And when I do this, it changes the angle that I would naturally be writing at. So instead I go here where everything is the same angle and comfortable. And then I move my paper and then I write here move my paper and write here. Mm. So you, this really never changes. Okay. Uh, there are certain capitals and whatnot that I have little tweaks, but that's specific sort of scenario. Now, if you're writing at the bottom of the page, you pull the paper all yep. the way up. You're pretty much always writing in the exact same spot. But you're moving your paper. Yes. You're not moving your hand. No. Which is, which is what 
a novice might assume. Mm -hmm. Oh, you write like this, and, well, you, yeah, and you move your arm yeah, away. Yeah, it happens in leather writing or letter writing all the time. People will write, and the writing on this side of the page is never as good as the writing on this side of the page because they reach. They'll end up reaching. They think they can go, or they get then squished, and everything's hovering. If I'm writing down here, there's nothing supporting. Yeah. I have to, like, it's not going to be as good and as comfortable as if I'm here. I'm here, my shoulders are relaxed, all of my arm weight is here, so I can just flow my letter forms like so. So the first part of the warm-up, do you do ovals? I usually do ovals. You could do ovals or what we call push-pulls, straight lines. I usually go ovals, then push-pulls. Let's do ovals, because I like to do ovals, too. Perfect. So we load our nib with some ink. Yep. We double-check that the ink is um, doesn't require more saliva or anything, that there's no sort of beads of ink, that the ink is fully coating the nib. And then... And you check. You always check your, I, this like, is whether it's working. Very much a habit of mine, yes. I give a little, just a tick to make sure that the ink is down at the tip. Yeah. And then you make your ovals. With a very light hand. Yeah, so there's no, there's no pressing into the page. Basically, if I were to hold this here, like, it's going to look like garbage, but that's my... That's the way. This is how I teach the ideal hairline. Yeah. Like, if you're holding way back here, that's showing you the hairline that your nib is capable of. Oh, because there's no pressure yeah. on it. So now if I hold the pen and it looks like this, I'm adding pressure where I shouldn't. Okay. So if my lines, when I'm doing my ovals, should look like that same hairline. If we've taken a little pause mm -hmm. from writing, clean the nib? That's a, it's another, like, opening the jar. It's a good habit to get into. Why? Um, if, if we think of, like, these nibs are so fine, mm -hmm. the very point... That's where the ink is going to dry first. Mm -hmm. So if it dries there and I go to write again, the wet ink might still go down just because of the, the shape of the nib and gravity, but it's going to be going over then dry ink. Right. So you're not going to get quite as nice of a flow. So I'm in the habit of any time I stop to talk or anything like when I'm on video or in a class, any time we pause, it's just sort of a habitual thing where Clean we stop, up. talk, and then we go. Because you're... We're not worried about wasting ink. It's so much, so little ink, and a fresh nib is always better than a used one. So, anytime we pause, you clean. just clean your nib. Okay. I think it was somebody Mike saw once upon a time said, "Thou shalt not let ink dry on thy nib," or something to that effect, and it just that Stays rings in, in my head forever. Hairline. Yes. Hairline. What does a hair? I know what a hairline <laughs> is, but for those of you out there that don't know what that means. What, what is a hairline? So the hairline is our thinnest stroke. Okay. So you could, I could pluck out a hair and put it on the page, mm -hmm. and essentially a, a push stroke is the easiest way to get a clean hairline, but a line with no extra weight or no anything to it, that's a hairline. Okay. It's the thinnest strokes. Um, in Spencerian, we have shaded strokes where we would be doing strokes that pull down and we add weight and stuff to things. Mm -hmm. So that's our contrast. We have our shaded strokes and our hairline strokes. And the beauty of this of this this writing is the contrast between these hairlines and then these yeah. broad strokes sitting side by side. That is what actually helps to make it legible. Yep. Like discernible what a certain letter is, but mm -hmm. it's also what makes it so beautiful. So the contrast makes the contrast. it yeah, super beautiful. And what I love in comparison to like, and I, I love all calligraphic styles, I do mo many of them, like broad pen scripts, your certain strokes are always weighted or thick strokes because you're using a broader nib. Mm -hmm. but this one with the with the pointed pen, yeah, I could be I could do this stroke without a shade, it could be all hairlines. I could do that same thing with a shade just at the very top. You could do that same thing with a shade at the bottom. Um, like we choose so it, that's where it becomes very artistic. Mm -hmm. You might shade something slightly different than I shade something. So your writing is your voice on paper versus like they, we won't look the same when we write. We don't sound the same when we talk. So I like that we don't have to look the same when we write. Yeah. That's what I think I love most about this. The dancer wants to express and this is in writing the best way that I can express. That was said very beautifully in the opening of one of these old books mm. that at, these books were written in the 1800s at a time when the way that you communicated with someone was by speaking or by writing mm -hmm. and that your hand, your penmanship reflected who you were. 
So there was the encouragement in the book to really focus on creating a beautiful hand because when you sent a letter to somebody, you were showing them who you were. Mm -hmm. And I think that that today is like, that's lost in penmanship. Most people, if they had to write something by hand, and they, it would not be a reflection of who they are because they just don't have that skill. Yep. Really watch Mike's wrist and hand and see how it's not moving. Yep, nothing moves. This, this, is, this is moving over mm -hmm. here. This joint is moving so subtly and, and it's even moving when he makes, can you make a really tiny oval, mm -hmm. a teeny tiny? It's still moving from here. His wrist isn't moving to yeah, make None that. of this moves. And, and that takes so much practice. That because is, you, because you feel out of control the yeah, first time you totally. try it. And, and they this, won't look pretty. No. I have a disclaimer. I teach a class called The Art of Movement Writing, mm -hmm. where I use a metronome and I force people to write at a fast, uncomfortable, for them, usually, speed. And there's a disclaimer that comes before the class that everybody has to like repeat after me and... We're going to make garbage. What you put on the page is not going to be pretty because you have to do it to learn to do it. If you're always going slow, you can get a perfectly shaped oval, but it's not going to have the beautiful, wispy, light hairline. And that's, it's not about speed, it's about the fluidity of that yeah. movement. And that's different for different people. People younger than me can probably write slower than me and maintain a nice fluid form. As I get older, I'll probably have to write a little faster to maintain as my muscles get um, less fluid yeah. as we get older and whatnot. But a, a singing teacher once said to me when we were going up and I didn't want to, I, was, I wasn't doing it because I was scared my voice was going to crack. And she just banged on the piano and she turned around and she said, it has to sound awful before it can sound good. Mm -hmm. And she yelled that at me. <laughs> and that has never left to me because that is applicable to anything. It has, if you're not willing to make it badly in the beginning, you're never gonna learn. Never. So we've been making counterclockwise ovals. Yes. And and now we're gonna make ovals that are clockwise. Clockwise, right? yeah. Now we go clockwise to make a indirect oval, they're called. The reason we're doing this, we're making ovals clockwise and counterclockwise is because Spencerian script is made up of these strokes and we have to move our arm both clockwise and counterclockwise, mm -hmm. so we're prepping for that motion. Spencerian script. We keep saying Spencerian script. It is a script that was developed by someone named Platt Roger Spencer in the 1840s. Uh, well, he developed it in like early, mid-1800s. Okay. Uh, the Spencerian school existed from, I believe, 1853 till 1863, mm -hmm. but he started teaching it in like Officially in the I would say 1830s. He taught his first class when he was 12 and he was born in 1800 what? So do that okay. back to what so, year that so, was so we know we, early, 1800s. early 1800s and he was inspired by nature He was yeah. inspired by the natural forms of trees and water mm -hmm. and the way the landscape was was uh, Around him He's in Ohio, right? Yeah, there was pebbles on the beach in Geneva, Ohio mm -hmm. um, If you go to that beach many of the pebbles the waves have made them beautiful, rounded ovals. Wow. So it's said that he was inspired by, this is where the oval forms of Spencerian come from, because of that. And then the wings of birds and just the fluidity in nature. Nature isn't a lot of straight lines and circles. It's very ovals, uh, or it's very curved and natural. And so Spencerian is very curved and natural. Prior to Spencerian, most of the styles of writing that were used in uh, North America came from Europe, like mm -hmm. the English round hand and whatnot, which were more rounded with straight lines, slower, more so drawn forms, beautiful forms, but more drawn forms. So if you were to write them for a long extended period of time, there would be fatigue in your hands. And even when you're doing it right, going a long time can get fatigued. So, so he wanted something that could just... That what was built with the body in mind, which as a dancer, that's one of the things that makes me love it so much because yeah. it's it's as close to dancing with a pen in my hand as I could yep. get, basically. The Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. that was written in English roundhand, right? Yes. Yeah, so this is a very good reference. If you just look up the Declaration of Independence, that is not this script. No. That is the formal script that came over from Europe. And Platt Roger Spencer developed his own script, which actually 
changed and turned into the script that was taught in public schools in America. It so, became the, the go-to in, I would say, 1850s. It became sort of like the de facto style of writing that was used in America. Yeah. So what we're doing today is Spencerian script. Yes. Ovals. Okay, back to ovals. <laughs> Okay, so, so we don't have to do, we'll just do a few more uh, indirect ovals, clockwise ovals. And then we do what are called push pulls. Okay, let's so they're, the they're push just pull. straight lines. At ideally, Spencerian was written at a 52 degree slant. Mm -hmm. So we just, same thing, nothing in my hand is moving, I'm just rolling on that forearm. Are you actually drawing a stroke up and down? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Done this in so long. Hey, hey. Too much harp practice. No such thing. Yeah, so these are just, we just do some of these, and you don't have to fill a page. You don't even have to fill half a page. I usually just do a few lines to get myself in. This is sort of get my writing zone. It also slow your brain down, relax, you get zoned into what you're doing. And then I feel like I'm ready to write. Okay. Can we show them if, if you were if you were just warming up a little more and you mm -hmm. went from these ovals and push pulls to a letter, like if you were doing the lowercase n. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the lowercase n is a perfect example because like Spencerian is broken down into, there's a few principles. Like one is the downstroke, mm -hmm. one is the overturn, one is the underturn. Um, and by combining those sort of three, you get like the n is an overturn, a downstroke, an overturn, a downstroke, and an understroke and an undercurve. Mm -hmm. So that makes the lowercase n. So when we combine those principles, we have the one and two. It is so fine that I'm not <laughs> even the camera. <laughs> I'm not even sure if the overhead <laughs> camera will pick this up, but the inspiration for me whenever I'm sitting beside Mike is seeing how fine how fine his writing is. And there's little Yes. You can add, that's where we say character, or like the, the voice we were talking about earlier, the N can have that little shade on that last downstroke. Ugh, it's like, you inspire me to have such a light hand, and whenever you leave, it becomes so heavy again, <laughs> and clumsy. The one thing too, it doesn't have to continue. Like, I write quite quickly, mm -hmm. um, but Anytime there is what I call a hard stop would be like the bottom of the N right here. Yes. Anytime there's a point, you can stop. Um, some people oh. don't like to stop. If you're doing, say, a variation of business writing, you would continue going fast, stopping as little as possible because you need to write as much as possible in a short amount of time. So you want to write fast. But if we're doing Spencerian ornamental penmanship, we just want it to look nice. Mm -hmm. And slight pauses don't slow us down that much. So it's the movement of the, of the stroke that is important. So the first stroke would be our overturn and our downstroke. So that stroke, that's the one where you wouldn't be stopping anywhere in there. At least I don't stop anywhere in there. So you would do, that's the stroke that you want to be nice and smooth. Then you can pause. Yeah. Um, you don't have to pause for a long time, but then you place the nib back down and do the second stroke, which is the overturn, the downstroke, and the underturn. That so you has do to be that. done in one, right? Like so, some penmen would would go here. Here, I'll do a big one so the camera can see it. Sure. Turn this here. Some penmen would go, and they would lift here mm -hmm. and then finish, and curve that out. But because this is technically a, it's not a point at the bottom. It's a curved spot. I don't like to lift any place there's a curve. Right. Because it makes placing my nib back down when your hairlines are so fine, placing the nib back down on that exact spot is incredibly difficult, or mm -hmm. can be incredibly difficult. Whereas, like the first one, I'll do another big one, I can place my nib there relatively easily, and you don't know that I lifted there. Right. But if I had this second stroke that's supposed to be curved on the bottom, and I did this, it might it's harder to hide that lift at the bottom. Um, what some, I guess, old penmen back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, if they had a shade on that stroke, they would potentially lift after the shade, and then they can hide their drop down because it comes out of the shade. Oh. So that's, some penmen would often lift there. I personally try not to. I, as a rule, most of the time I only lift where there's a hard stop. So I would do this last stroke as a continuous okay. motion. After doing ovals and push pulls, mm -hmm. 
we often move just to writing lines of lowercase letters. Yeah. Can you just show us a line of lowercase a's? Yes, of course. Please. You got it. So with the a, we would just do... And you can practice combining the two if you want. An A and an N. Yeah, we just have an A into an N. So then we're just adding that compound curve stroke in the middle to connect them. Beautiful. And now I think it would be lovely for everyone to see what a shade is. Mm -hmm. Because so the beauty of this writing and the beauty of this specific nib is its ability to open up when pressure is applied and allow the ink to spread onto the page. So maybe can you write the letter P for us, please? Like a lowercase p? No, uh, an uppercase p. An uppercase or, or maybe p. what's a good letter for this? Like an L. How about an L? A capital L? Yes, please. Sure. So I would do the capital L like so. Like so. Beautiful. And And can you see where that thick part of the letter is. That is when Mike was pulling down, he applied pressure to the nib and the nib yeah. opens up and gives you what we call a swell. We do one in slow motion. We would go, whoops. I'm just applying pressure there to get that shade or swell. Then you come out of it to have the hairline exit stroke. Beautiful. Could you do one that's maybe double that size, please? You got is it. Is that possible? Yeah, sure. Okay. There's a big one. Do you see that? It's a little more loopy. Beautiful. Maybe we'll just show them a couple more letters. Sure. That that are, that are a good example of the swell. How about uh, an, M? an I, M? I love the M. You got it. I'll do a. Are you okay if I do a little flourish in the oh, beginning please, of the M? Please, by all means, all flourish right. away. So that's our stem stroke of the M. Then we have the two, like so. Wow, stunning, <laughs> stunning. It's just really an inspiration. And when I sit next to Mike, I understand how people were actually, because you see actual old, old examples of this from the 1800s, and I can't actually believe that it was possible. But when I sit next to this guy, I, <laughs> I see like, oh, the human hand is capable of doing it. It's real inspiration. Do you have a favorite letter? Uh, I, the whole my alphabet? favorite letter is the one you already wrote, which is why we started with it. Ah, the, the L. L. Okay. Um, do you have a least favorite letter? I do. The J. Ah. I, the J I always struggle with. I like have to write the J, the capital <laughs> J so often, and I just think, like, how do I make this beautiful? So, fun fact, J was one of my most hated letters mm -hmm. once upon a time. It is now one of my favorite letters. And the reason, I'm actually kind of glad I did this flourish on the M, what opened up the J for me was this double uh, entry flourish. Okay. Because which that seems weird because that's like a more complicated stroke. But I wrote M's a lot because they're in my name, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I got used to this doing the two ovals into this compound curve and coming up into the shade. Uh, with a J, the J starts like the capital I. They come up down and they shade below the baseline. Mm -hmm. And it was always, the starting here was always really weird for me. I, it was tentative and it never felt right. When I learned that I can, this just comes out of this, that I could do a J but start it this way, I could do my natural, I'll just do one loop though, my natural entry that I was so used to <laughs> while making a J, it was like, oh, I can enter into not my comfort zone with my comfort zone and it just made the J feel natural and comfortable for me. That is what you showed me. That is, is this, this what we is, talked about last time? This is what you did show me. And it's just like, because it's, there is, he's not just making these strokes willy-nilly. It is mathematical. Where every line crosses another line is a very specific architectural point on the letter, letter which he has planned out and has practiced to hit exactly. We try to hit the right spots. We don't always yes. hit the exact so right spots, So I'm going to do the fake version. I'm just going to, we won't see this on camera because we don't have the <laughs> overhead, but I'm going to just emulate it 
and oh my god mm -hmm. oh see okay let's pull let's let's pull this apart of why like so first thing the mistake that i'm making that i forgot so the swell should be you have it right on here and and i have it over there but there's yeah this, can you so the, tell the, us the, all the proportions of so what's happening here if we're my lowercase letters i don't have this i didn't write this exactly on where to, my lines would be or imagine the our baseline is right there for Joanne or whatever yep. name we're going to write. The lowercase live here. Mm -hmm. The shade lives. It starts below the baseline. Oh. And then there's different rules and different sort of sayings on how far they should go below the baseline. Mm -hmm. um, but the shade lives between that point. It doesn't start above that. And it has to taper into a hairline before we get to the bottom. Yep. So the shade just lives. That taper lives in that point there before we come up which you tapered off it was just you started because your baseline would be about right there for that mm -hmm. you just started the shade a little too soon okay which is an easy thing to fix it's just controlling where we add that pressure and then you have this beautiful curve here that you can almost see a c in there mm -hmm. and this is not a point it's a curve it's not this i always make this mistake of making this a point up here this is a, a big reason why we do ovals and if like these are with this is an entry flourish basically going into the J, as we did our warm up ovals from earlier, we would also do horizontal ovals if we were going to be doing flourishing and whatnot. Yes. Um, and it's how you can know if a flourish is sort of right or mm -hmm. there's no wrong, but right or not as right. Mm -hmm. um, first one, this stroke here is just creating. There's what we call an implied oval right there. Ah, uh, so it, you've only drawn half of that oval. Yeah. Okay. And then, ideally, admittedly, this stroke should have come down a little bit lower. Um, but then, from there, the bottom half of this oval would then do what's called a compound curve to go up to meet this oval. And then we have this is an implied oval here. Can you draw that? Yeah, wow. Yeah, so we have this oval yep. transi transitioning into this oval. Mm -hmm. And then from there, if we imagine a very large oval here, we're now transitioning into this large oval. The big oval. Yeah. Big, large one. As we get to uh, the part where we want to have our downstroke. Is that on we, that 52 degree slant? This is, well, I don't always write exactly 52, but. But I, that is on the slant. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this, it's close to 52. I usually write between 50, 48 and 52, depending on how I'm writing it. So that's this, our downstroke. Mm -hmm. So we have a nice curve into that downstroke. Um, some letters we want to be not super round, but not sharp either. We get that nice medium curve, and then straight down on the slant line. And then as we come over here, we have our descender stroke, which just gives us sort of like a little teardrop at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then this exit stroke, even this trajectory here, is if you imagine... Right. A large implied oval that we're going into there, we get that oval. So when you're practicing, when people see me do like the M and the L, how fast it moves, that's getting used to this oval, transitioning into that oval. So that transition then, transitioning then into this oval, going from the small oval to the big oval, and then from the small oval into the big oval, into the downstroke. And then from that downstroke into this large oval. And then just lifting up when we hit the baseline. So we get the whole thing, whoops, to finish the whole Beautiful. letter. This is the behind the scenes yes. of all of these letters. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I, even when I'm writing on the chalkboard, I'll stop halfway and just erase it. Yep. Because I, I saw, oh, I didn't hit this point. Mm -hmm. And... This is the beauty. The beauty of this is not just the ink, but the space. Yes. The space between the lines is half of it, well, really. I, li I like that you brought up space, because it's things like this. Uh, this M, you'll notice this cross point. What's the yeah. middle there? there this, this cross point mm -hmm. is right in the middle of this smaller implied oval. So each four of these, call them quadrants, has as much space as it could. Yeah. So this portion of this letter is breathing as much as it could. Nothing feels tight. If if this line was too far over here, this little square gives like a subconscious 
it's the tightness. And when everything is open, like right here, admittedly, this is a little small. So of this whole thing, this feels, this makes me feel, mm -hmm. it needs to be, it should have been over here a little bit more. So there's, so everything has space and is airy and is free. Nothing feels tight. This is not a lesson in how you learn the M, but I did want to share this with everyone so that we can pull back the curtain and reveal how much dedication and practice mm. and thought goes into every one of these strokes. You're, you're not just... They don't just come out of nowhere. They don't, you're not just yeah. pulling them out of your ass, if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, so can we get a fresh piece of paper? And of can course I just can. ask you to write some capitals with flourishes? Oh, certainly. They'd like play around and show yeah. you. Just do a little call and response. Yeah, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, of course. I would love to see a capital I because Sounds an good. I is one of those letters that is also sometimes a big question mark for people. Yes. How do I write an I? Because the Spencerian I is... Lowercase capital is what we're Capitals. Talking. You got it. So a capital I... There's our capital I. Beautiful. And maybe, could you put in the lowercase, like if we were writing Ian, I-A-N. Right. Yeah. So this relationship between the large letters and the small letters, this, the proportions, that's also part of the beauty of this script. Mm -hmm. The ratio, like you can see, my capital is huge compared to my lowercase mm -hmm. letters. Traditionally in Spencerian, the capital would be three times the height, so it would be here. Mm -hmm. When I go into the realm of ornamental penmanship and I like to play, you can push it to four, five, or six, anything above six, and it kind of gets a bit too much. Um, the contrast is just too much between the, the big and littles, but that I like a really big capital and a really, really tiny yeah. lowercase letter. One of the other things that Mike is a pro at is taking these flourishes and enveloping the small letters with the flourishes. So could I just give you a couple of names and would you sure. be able to write them for yeah. us? This is all impromptu. I can try it. Off this the cuff. All yeah. off the cuff. And you got it. Also, what fascinates me and really <laughs> demonstrates his ability. Can you write the name Wook for us, please? Sure. Like where the U-K-E is enveloped in the... Mm -hmm. Do you want me to... Should I get like... Do you want me to put like an ending flourish on it just as well? Go, just go wild. <laughs> like how you would when you're... Sounds good. Pulling out all the stops, please. Of course. So? Beautiful. Okay, how about what else we got? Pablo? Pablo, sure. Beautiful. I want you to also, you've probably noticed, before Mike sometimes puts the actual <laughs> nib on the page, he rehearses the movement with his arm. And this is crucial because once the nib hits the page, you can't stop. You can't be thinking. And you can't think that fast. No, you can't. <laughs> I wish I could think that fast. I can't. I want to share a story which my friend Laura shared with me when we were talking about the very same thing. When you're writing, you can't stop. Mm -hmm. There's a very famous document which always gives me the chills when I talk about it. It's Marie Antoinette's wedding certificate. Mm -hmm. I think she was 14 when she got married. She was really young. Her name was Maria Antonia something, something, something. And when she married into the French royal family, they said, we're going to change your name. It's going to be Antoinette to okay. make it French. Right. And on this marriage certificate, which is in a book, there are like 16 different signatures. Mm -hmm. Louis' signature, her signature, and witnesses. And right over where the E is, there's a huge blob. Ah. Oh. Because she stopped. She was writing with a quill. And when she went to write she her hesitated. name, she hesitated because she had never written Antoinette before. And it gives me that, I've seen that, ah. you, that document where there's all these beautiful signatures and right above E-T-T-E, -E, there's this big unsightly blob. Because she stopped. She stopped. Can't stop. And the crazy thing is that in this book, 
the blob is mirrored on the other side, mm. which means they shut the book as the ink was wet. Right. And this is, the, I, I bring this up because this is also the beauty of writing with pen and ink. Sometimes the mistakes are the most important part. Sometimes the flaws of something, when they're left, they tell us, they, they tell the viewer something. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is the, this is the beauty of it. What you see is what you get. They're, they don't have to be perfect. They don't, there is no perfect. You're getting, when I'm talking to you, if I make a mistake, I don't get to edit that mistake. Same thing in my writing. Mm -hmm. I don't get to edit. You just get, you get what you get. If it's yeah. perfect, sweet. Yeah. But there's no such thing as perfect, so. I love that. <laughs> Can I give you a name that is not a, like a co conventional Western name? Because I'm often writing Tamil names, which are really long. Of course. So do you want me to write it out for you or should I say it? Um, I'm going to give you two you versions. I'm going to give you the shorter one. Okay. We're going to we're going to write Kalyani. Okay. K A L Y A N I. Sounds good. K A L Y A N I. Yes. Y A N I? K A L Y A N I. Sounds good. Beautiful. Okay, can I give you a really, really, really hard name, which you're going to believe is not even real, but it <laughs> you're just is... just making up words. No, now. it Let's is real. It. Can I give you my aunt's name? Sure. I'm going to have to write it out for you because there's no way you're going to... Say it first. I won't remember it as we're going. Okay, but... her name is Madana Kama Lochini. That's her first name. <laughs> Pat Gunaraja. That's her last name. Okay. Do you, you want me to write, write this? that down okay, I'm going to <laughs> 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 One of the main issues with like doing Spencerian or ornamental penmanship writing, it takes quite a bit of horizontal space. Yes. So that's where this becomes a bit of a challenge. That is a real Tamil name. On one line. Can we, you get that on one line? We can try. <laughs> I don't see why we can't try. That's an M? No, that's an H. All right. A-N. Sorry, pauses where I don't want them in here. A-K-A. -A. thing we'll do this oh wow and give it a nib on the end <gasps> beautiful <laughs> you did it you wrote it just my, fit. you wrote just. my aunt's crazy long name fully <laughs> so i bring this up because one of the things that calligraphers often get in terms of work is addressing envelopes mm -hmm. for weddings or for events and when i've done this in the past i don't do it anymore i've moved on past envelope addressing but when i started out as a calligrapher I would get the stationery from the bride mm -hmm. and I would get the list of all of the names and addresses and sometimes I would look at these names and think, how am I going to fit that onto an envelope? And s s you have to figure it out. You just Gotta have to, yep. which, which is such a joy to see <laughs> from someone so skilled. Uh, this has been so much fun, Mike. It's been great. I'm sure so many of you out there are intrigued by Mike and what he's shown us today. So if you would like to learn more about him, just check out the description of this video and there will be links to your website, your Instagram, and you do a live stream every week when you're in Vancouver, yes. right? So yep. West Coast time, what time? Uh, 9 p.m. 9 p.m. West Coast time where he's live streaming and that really is the best place for you to ask him technical questions because he, he will be doing something and you can ask him right away and he will respond. Mm -hmm. 
Mike, thank you so much for coming all the way to New York City. You know, the last time he was here, he was staying, sorry, the last, <laughs> the last time Mike was in New York staying here with me, he was actually visiting the New York Public Library every day, like from open till close, mm -hmm. to study some pieces in their archive, actual examples that were written pen and ink on paper from the 1800s, mm -hmm. late 1800s, early 1900s, yeah. right? Uh, and so Mike has, is, his brain is full of so much information that you have so generously shared with anyone who is enthusiastic enough to ask you. So you just gotta ask. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank for you for me. thank you for coming and thank you all for watching. Goodbye. Thank you.